shepherd's call. And I know what I'm talking about. Do you remember the shepherd's call? Amen. How many of you do? Yes, sir. Some of them still, boy, their age is catching up with them. I think that's the name of his radio broadcast. And, and uh, now they're going to glory. Thank God we're going right behind them. Amen. Won't be won't be long because uh, when he's on the cross, we're on his mind. Amen. All right, I want to preach to you tonight. Uh, preach to you on the subject of uh, of righteousness. That's a good subject. And I want you to look in the book of Isaiah chapter 64 and we'll get our, get our text from there. Isaiah chapter 64. Uh, this sermon is especially, I had in mind, uh, for somebody that was struggling with, am I saved or am I not saved? Now, I hear folks talk about, well, I've never doubted and I've never struggled. Uh, be honest with you, they're probably lying to you. I don't doubt now and I don't struggle with it now. But I had problems 30, 40, 50 years ago when I first started. The devil tried to tell me I wasn't saved and, and uh, the, I thought it was me that wasn't saved. And How would I get saved? How would you get saved? What would we need? If we, if we wanted to get saved, what would be the requirement for being saved? Did I have to be, did I have, I'm, I'm preaching, okay. Did, did I have to be uh, uh, good? Did I have to be uh, uh, some kind of a ceremony? Did I, what, what did it take for me to have the righteousness of God applied to where that I could stand in front of God Almighty and not be a, have to hang my head in shame. Well, I'm glad I found that out. Amen. And it's my desire today to try to help you to find it out. And so we're going to look first of all in the book of Isaiah chapter 64 and we'll start reading there at verse 4. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4. For since the beginning of the world men have not heard nor perceive by the ear, neither hath I seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. I read that some other place. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned. In those is continuance and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind hath taken us away. Amen. I want to call your attention to the prophet's words in verse 6. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. If you could describe the filthiest rag that you know of, and I don't, I, I really don't want to get into it. Let's say, for instance, I was sick at my stomach and I heaved right over this pulpit and I filled that communion table up with, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Vomit, okay. I was going to say puke, but, but vomit would be much better. Uh, and you would take, you would take a, a rag from the back of the church and you would come up here and you would wipe that up off of that table. Now, would you like to put that rag on and stand in front of God saying, look at me, how righteous I am? You'd say you'd be crazy to do that. Well, my friend, you are crazy to try to stand before God with your righteousness. It's the exact same thing. I could get more graphic than that. I'm not going to. But think of the filthiest rag that you have ever saw or ever had dealings with, and that's what we are in the sight of God. 
So now how can I get, how can I get from this position where I've got filth for clothing to a position where my clothing is satisfying and pleasing to Almighty God? That's what I want to speak about. And I want to uh, pull, if I can, an Old Testament character uh, out that you could, that you could uh, really go through this entire struggle with. I want to I wanna pull the man that nobody uh, ever says anything bad about. I mean, you know, if we were to pull Abraham out of the scripture, they would somebody say, well, Abraham wouldn't do because Abraham lied on several occasions. Uh, if I was to pull David out, you'd say, well, D David wouldn't do for an example because David committed adultery with another man's wife and then hired that man killed. So we couldn't use David. If I was to pull Moses out and say, well, we'll use Moses as the example. And somebody would say, well, don't you remember Moses did several tricks that wouldn't be righteous. Moses in one place killed that Egyptian, hit him in the sand. In another place, the most extreme place, Moses tried to crucify the Son of God afresh. Yes, he, took that, he took that rod whenever he smote that rock, when God told him just to speak to the rock, he was actually uh, in type crucifying Jesus twice. Yes, and amen. listen, one time did it. One time is all that we'll ever need, he'd ever need to die is that one time. And so I can't use Moses. I certainly can't use Adam. Uh, who could I use? Well, I want to use tonight the man that God, not men, but God called perfect. And I want to use him and his righteousness as compared to the righteousness of God. You say, well, God didn't call nobody perfect. Well, hang around. We'll see if he did. In the book of Job, chapter 1, we're going to use a man that God called perfect. Look, if you will, in Job, chapter 1. And I'll, read, I'll just read verse 1 there. Uh, there was... Are you, are you looking? You're not there yet? Oh, I guess it's because I already had it open. Job, chapter 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now I want you to notice that that is God's estimation of Job. Before this book ever gets started, before Satan ever came before him and made any accusation before we have any of the trials that he went through God has called this man perfect now one thing I like about God is God doesn't look at it the way we look at it God doesn't see the same way that man sees and another thing I like about God that he's able to call things that are not as though they were He's a, amen. If I was to look at, if I was to look at the Old Testament saints, I'd point out their faults. Amen. But when God looks at them in the New Testament, he does not point out their faults because they don't have any faults because God has covered them with the blood of the Lamb. And that covering of the blood of the Lamb will save and sanctify whosoever will. So let me pray and then we're going to uh, 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 try to look at this afflictions of Job and his righteousness and what it was that stood. Our Heavenly Father, today we thank you for the privilege to pray. We thank you for the singing that we've heard. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings. God, you've been good to us today. <coughs> Lord, we'd rather wear out for you as we would rust out for the devil. Help us, dear God, to always be about our Father's business. Give us grace, I pray, as we preach this sermon in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Now I started to read these, but I'll just give them to you. In the sixth chapter of the verse, in, in the first verse of the book of Job, the Bible says that, that Job answered and said. In the ninth chapter of the book of Job, in the first verse, the Bible says that Job answered and said. And in the twelfth chapter of the book of Job, in the first verse, it says the same thing. And in the sixteenth chapter of the book of Job, in the first verse, it says the same thing. And in the nineteenth chapter, in the twenty-first chapter, and the twenty-third chapter, and the twenty-sixth chapter, and that does not change until you get to the forty-second chapter. And in the forty-second chapter, that's the last chapter, Job changes the way he says that. Up until that time, what we've got on the chopping block is Job's righteousness. But when we get to the 42nd chapter of the book of Job, we find out that Job discovered his righteousness was filthy rags in the sight of God. What he thought was right and what he thought would get him accepted, he said, I abhor that and I repent. In sackcloth and ashes, I should have never opened my mouth. Will you admit with me? Uh, that, don't worry about that. That happens all the time. That there's a backslidden Baptist, I guess. Light goes on, light goes off. I got a bunch of that. But anyway, uh, uh, I want to study the afflictions of Job. The book is an answer on how a man can be right with God. That's what the book's written for. Most of us see the book of Job as a, a uh, collection of stories that are not even joined together. We'll have Job here, and we'll have the devil here, and we'll have his friends here, and we'll have God here, and, and, and we don't even put the stories together. The Lord will, and I want to try to put them together tonight to give you the picture of what God is trying to do here in this book. It is not how Job stood all the tests, and how he was rewarded, but it's rather how God Almighty upheld Job regardless of the test, and God's the one that said Job was perfect, and God is going to bring Job through and prove that he's perfect before this is over. Job was a genuinely good man. Now that's a problem, because you see, whenever we're good, we don't think we need saved. Amen, we think we're as good as anybody else. In fact, one of, the, one of the complaints that I hear when I talk to people about going to church is they're as good as the church people. Yeah. Uh, uh, Job was a good man, but Job had never been tried. And I want you to know that it's whenever the trial comes, yeah. whether you'll stand the test or not. Anybody can testify when things is going good and whenever the wind's blowing in your favor and whenever the south wind blows and you loose from the fair havens, you think you'll make it all right. But brother, when the ship is going down and God Almighty, you believe what he tells you, that that's when the trial comes to us. Trials are what separates the chaff from the wheat. Amen. It's easy to testify in church. Everybody's on your side. Amen. Go down there to the courthouse and testify at the abortion clinic. It doesn't get so easy down there. God had already blessed Job. Uh, and verse 1 there said Job was a perfect man. Job, when the story starts, he's a wealthy man. When the story starts, God has already settled him. And he, he, he said what, what Job's going to be. Now when the Christian is tested today, it's good to know that what is disputed by our adversary is already settled in the glory land. And what the devil tries to bring accusations against us because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we're already perfect in the sight of God. Now Job was blessed on the earth. Our blessings are not earthly. Our blessings are in heavenly places, Ephesians 1 and 3. Our inheritance is incorruptible, it's undefiled, and it's reserved in heaven for us. And I read here in the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, that we are not kept by our own ability, neither are we kept by our own righteousness, but we are kept by the power of God, and that's exactly what kept Job that day. 
Many years ago, I took that old account to the Lord Jesus Christ and he settled that count. And though the devil would try to bring up accusation against me from time to time, thank God my record's clear today for he washed my sins away. And the old account was settled long ago. It was God that said we were perfected forever. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14. God said Job was perfect man. Now was he? Are we? How much, I mean, if we were going to take a test tonight and we were going to say, well, how righteous are you? I'd give you a little blank and I'd say, you, you feel out how righteous you are. Amen. What would you put down? In my own evaluation, well, if I've had a pretty good day, I've been in church all day long, preach this is my third time preaching today, probably have had a pretty good day, I could maybe put down 75%. Am I, am I telling right? Some of you suckers ain't done nothing but sleep all afternoon. And whenever you got up, you was worried about the football game or whatever. You'd have to put down 10%. <laughs> am I telling right? Hello, are you back there? I hear you breathing. Amen. But the honest truth is, the honest to God truth, as Wendy Bagwell says with my hand up, the honest truth is you and I, if we are saved, we are 100%. And it is not based on us being in church all day or being asleep in front of the television set, but it's based on the blood of Jesus Christ and it's perfect and it perfects them that will come that way. Hallelujah. Now... It was God that said that Job was perfect. Uh, and so uh, let's look behind the veil now and we'll, we'll see what goes on in the glory land. And God calls a meeting. The devil doesn't call it. He don't ever want to go into the presence of God. That's why you can't get people to go to church. Amen. Amen. They don't like the presence of God. Amen. They get in the church house just quick as they can. They want to go from the presence of God. But God called a meeting and the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them. And let's look at what our adversary says. Uh, where you been, uh, Satan? Where you been, Lucifer? For you NIV people, where you been, Lucifer? Said, well, I've been going to and fro, walking up and down in the earth. Uh, uh, it all depends on whether you're talking about Old Testament or New Testament. In the New Testament, he said, I've been going here and yonder, looking whom I can devour. Yeah. And he was doing the same thing. And the Lord has graciously given us, us, given us a glimpse of, of the enemy's uh, uh, strategy and his activities. And God said to Lucifer, God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? I think if in his mind, I think he said something like that. Uh, what is that cereal commercial they used to have for sugar smacks or something? You bet your booties, Granny. I don't, I don't know, y'all might not be old, but what I'm saying is you can bet your farm on it. Yes, he's considered Job. Yes, he's looked at God's blessings on Job. And yes, he'd love to have an opportunity to get his claws and his hooks in that man that God has blessed. Yes, sir, he considered him. You may think uh, uh, that uh, the devil doesn't consider you, but he does. You may think the doors are locked, the doors are barred. Uh, you, may, uh, you may think that nobody knows, but think again. He's got a thousands and thousands of years of experience of considering Christian people, and he knows exactly where to hit them, where it hurts. Amen. said, have you considered my servant? Uh, 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 here is a foregone conclusion. You cannot beat the devil Amen. on your own. Amen. Your righteousness is not righteousness enough. You'll never do it. The devil hates you. He hates God. He hates Job. He hates the preacher. He hates the church. He hates smiling. He hates singing. He hates anything that gives glory to God. Now begins what I'm going to call the limited trials. That is that the devil wants an opportunity at Job, but he cannot put, oh man, 
It's getting good up here. I don't know where it is uh, back there or not. He cannot put on Job any more than God allows. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Everybody's happy. I mean, Job's happy. His wife's happy. The sons are happy. The daughters are happy. The servants are happy. Happy cattle don't come from California. Happy cattle come from us. Contented cows come from Job's place. But Satan is about to enter into this to see if he can destroy the happiness of Job. Satan is the one that inspired the Sabaeans to steal his livestock. He's the one that inspired them to kill his servants. He's the one that somehow controlled the weather and caused the fire to fall from heaven, lightning, I guess, to, to kill his sheep. He's the one that inspired the Chaldeans. They did not operate independently to steal his camels. In 119, he's the one that was behind the wind uh, that destroyed the house and the children. Hurricanes are called an act of God, but in actuality, they're just uh, the devil's act that God allowed to happen. First attack failed, right? Whenever he came, the first attack failed, and the Bible said that Job, there, I think it's in verse uh, 20 of chapter 1, the Bible said Job bowed his head and worshipped And he said in the 21st verse, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He did well. He did well. The second attack is not on his house. It's not on his children. It's not on his livestock. It's not on his wealth, but it's on his person. And he's allowed. Now, remember, don't lose my text. Our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. Do you remember what Isaiah the prophet said about the children of Israel? He said, when you look them over, there's not a place on them that isn't a putrefying soul. Amen. Their righteousness, there is not one thing from the top of their head to the sole of their foot. There is no righteousness in them. They're putrefying souls. And so the devil was allowed uh, to uh, afflict his, his body. And uh, he, uh, he afflicted him personally with, with the sores. Dear brother, without the blood of Jesus, you and I are nothing but putrefying sores in the sight of God. Satan not only inspires Sabians and Chaldeans and lightning and winds, but sometimes he even inspires your wife to come over. Hello, it's getting awful quiet in here. Sometimes your wife says, man, I can't take no more of this. Why don't you just curse God and die? Now, Job uh, uh, did not call her a fool. But he said, you talk like one. That's what I always tell my girls, you know. They come in here with many skirts on and all this makeup. And I'm not going to call them a whore, but they look like one. Amen. Okay? Amen. <laughs> Wake up, wake up, wake up. Are you back there? What I'm saying that he said, you talk like a foolish one. You don't talk like my wife. Now, from then on, Satan changes his strategy. And this is where the, the battle really begins. It's not with Satan outright, but it's with his buddies. It's with his friends. I used to say it was with the deacon board. Uh... They misunderstood him, they accused him, they belittled him, and it was all done by his friends. They came over, they sat there for a week, and and they pitied him and felt sorry for him. Here he sat there with all these sores on his body and everything, but then at the end of the week, uh, amen, uh, uh, we as Christians uh, uh, only knowing redemption uh, uh, don't have the power to fight. But at the end of the week, we're going to get in a fight. You think you were mended at the altar. You think that whenever you came, that you were saved and you'll never have another problem, never have another trouble. According to that Joel Osteen bunch, you'll just be happy and smiling forevermore. You'll never have another sorrow. You'll never have another rent come due. You'll never have another problem because you're saved and God's children are supposed to be blessed. Let me pass the offering plate. Yeah, amen. 
But the truth of the matter is, the battle has just started. Whenever you give your life to the Lord, don't you think it's a free ride from then on out? The devil is going to do something and anything he can to test and try that life and make sure that we're doing what we are. If there is a spot in your flesh that he can get to, he'll get there. And since there's no place in your flesh that isn't nothing but rotten, we're going to have to have a sustaining power. And... The only place I know that you can rest is in Jesus. Amen. That's the only place I know you can rest is in Jesus Christ. How disgusting to find myself after I'm saved to sin. How uh, I hate sin. I fear sin. Sin brings sorrow, but we can't conquer it. There it is, and it's in my body, and it's a putrefying sore. And it whispers like Job's friends that we are really hypocrites at heart, that we are lost. We wish we had never been born. That's what Job said. Amen. Now, starting with chapter 4, we get the attack of his buddies, and they came up there, and, and Job claims uh, self-righteousness. Eliphaz, he's the first one to come in, and he said, Job, you talk a good game. You've been bragging about how good you are, but the truth of the matter is you've been instructing everybody else, but when it comes your turn, you really don't look so good. Here you sit out here, if you'd been the good man you claim to be, you wouldn't be in this problem. Yeah, amen. amen. Yeah. Did the devil ever tell you that? <laughs> Did the devil ever tell you, hey, if you're as righteous as you think you are, you wouldn't be having these doubts and fears yeah, in your life? You're going to be a disgrace to the name of Christian. The truth is, Job, you've plowed iniquity and you're going to reap the same. Job, you're a hypocrite. That's your problem. Amen. The devils came to me and said, ain't no point in you going back to church. I mean, here you are calling yourself a Christian and losing your temper. Now, I'm sure that none of you have did that, especially when somebody cuts you off in one of your automobile experiences, I'm sure you said, bless you, brother. <laughs> Did the flesh ever whisper to your soul and Satan ask you, would you be in this kind of a shape if you was a Christian? Would you have this kind of distress in your life if you were a child of God? Now, it is true that a hypocrite's hope will perish, but the lie was that Job wasn't a hypocrite. Job was doing the very best he did. Amen. And the truth of the matter is, most young Christians are not hypocrites. They're doing the very best they can, and the devil jumps on them anyway. Amen. Now, I would have wrongly applied it to Lot. If somebody would have asked me about Lot, was Lot a hypocrite? I'd have probably said, yeah. I would have wrongly applied it to Lot. Uh, uh, when he was in that cave outside of Sodom, I'd have probably been one of the first to call him a hypocrite. Yeah. But he wasn't. Amen. I would have wrongly applied it to Peter when I heard him cursing. Amen. Amen. And when I heard him denying his Lord, I'd have said, Peter's a hypocrite. But he wasn't. Amen. You remember what Jesus said to him? Jesus said, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. And I want you to know that the prayers of Jesus Christ have got value in the throne of God. Then I'd have probably wrongly applied it when I saw Judas Iscariot coming over there and griping about them spending the money for uh, uh, things they shouldn't spend it for. He wanted to put it in his pocket. I mean, he wanted to help the poor with it. I've always noticed that about folks that's worried about the poor. Yeah. Amen. They run around with Rolex watches on their arm. They run around in Cadillacs and hollering, we're here to help the poor people. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You could apply it to Judas. Judas was a hypocrite. Yeah. Judas never was a Christian. Amen. Judas never was saved. He sought, the Bible said, he sought opportunity to betray the Lord. Yeah. Now, I've never done that. Hello? Amen. It's awful quiet in this room. I have never sought the opportunity to sin. But I have sinned. Amen. Thank you. Amen. 
I may be as unstable as water, but in my heart, I want to serve God. I do not want to let him down. And whenever I feel that I have let him down, it just crushes me inside. And I cannot rest until I go to him and confess my sin. And thank God I've got a promise that if I'll confess my sin, he is faithful and just and he'll forgive me of my sin. Now, Satan is highly effective at misapplying Scripture. He'll come in and he'll insinuate that God is mean. He'll insinuate that church is no fun. God will surely deal with you as your sins deserve. One time I was reading through the book of Psalms and I come across this verse, Psalm 103, verse 10. He hath not dealt with us according to what we deserve. If you have been there, you testify no help I looked, but I couldn't find anybody on my right hand. I couldn't find anybody on my left hand. But I tonight know one that will help you. I know one, and he's on the right hand of God. We're looking in the wrong place. We're looking down here. We're wanting the preacher to help us. We're wanting mama to help us or daddy to help us or the government to help us or the social program to help us. I'm telling you tonight, if you'll look up there, there's one up there that will help you. A very present help in the time of trouble. That's what he said. Now in chapter 8, the devil inspired friend number 2, Bildad, and he comes around. He says something like this, well, the rust can't grow up without the mire. And what that means is where there's smoke, there's fire. (laughs) What that means is, Job, I I, I know that you're claiming that you're not, but truth of the matter is it had to be something there. Got to be something there or you'd be doing well. I guess it's true, but how can a man be just with God? Friend, do not seek God's justice. Listen to me tonight. You listen to me. Do not ask God to treat you justly. Ask God to treat you mercifully. Because if we get justice, we're going to hell. Because the wages of sin is death. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if we got what we deserve tonight, we would go to hell. Thank God I've got mercy. I've got grace. And I don't get what I deserve. I get what Jesus deserves. A glimpse of our need is found in Job chapter 9 verse 33. When he said, oh, I wish I just had a, a the, the Bible calls it a daysman. That, that's somebody that's able to fill in the gap between me and God. If I just had somebody that was able to reach up there and get a hold of God and able to reach down and get a hold of me, if I just had a person like that, (laughs) well, they wasn't there. They wasn't there in the Old Testament. Amen. All they had was the blood of bulls and goats. But I want you to know tonight that Jesus Christ is able to reach up and get a hold of God and God honors his grip, able to reach down and get hold of me and reconcile the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Uh, uh, Let's hear from from friend number three, Zophar, chapter 11. Uh, He talks about the magnificence and the majesty and compared to Job uh, who is unclean. And Job uh, uh, 11 and 6 He said, God's actually easier on you than you deserve. Well, that's probably true. But the whole problem is that you're a sinner. You see, that's your problem, Job. You're a sinner. Job's answer is still unanswered. How can a sinner be right with God? Now, Job's last speech there in the 29th chapter uh, uh, is about self-righteousness. I wish it was like it was when I... In my youth, did you ever say, I wish it was like it was when I first got saved? I wish it was like it was then. He spends two or three chapters explaining his faithfulness. That's all I got to say, he said in chapter 31, verse 40. Job said, my words is ended. I'm not going to say no more. Uh, No, you got a little bit more to say, Job. Thank you, life. You got a little bit more to say, Job. 
You see, your words is ended as far as men are concerned, but God is going to come talk to you. He said, I am not a sinner. God says you are a sinner. God's not against Job. God's against Job's righteousness. God had already declared that Job was perfect, but he had to show Job that the only way he could be perfect would be God to declare him perfect and not himself to declare him perfect. We're guilty. We need mercy. Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. We need mercy, not judgment. We need the mercy of God. If we would have been just a little better, we could have trusted our own self-righteousness all the way to hell. Amen. I'm glad I wasn't a little better. I'm glad that I was a sinner. And I'm glad, Miss Lois, that God saves old sinners. Amen. I'm glad that I don't have my righteousness to stand before God, but I've got the righteousness of Jesus Christ to stand there. God purposes a 100% deliverance. Not, we want partially delivered. Yeah. Hey Amen. We, we'd, like we'd like to have good children grow up and, and get a good job and have a lot of money. And do. Don't work. It doesn't work that way. God doesn't want it that way. God wants your hope to be put in heaven yeah. and heavenly things. And if you don't have nothing but a tent or a cottage down here, you don't need to care because God's building a palace for us over yonder. 38th chapter of Job, God speaks uh, personally to Job and, and says, Job, you're not wise enough, powerful enough, spiritual enough, warrior enough to tell God anything. You're griping, but under the, the auspice of Leviathan, God shows that Satan's too big for you, Job. Yeah. You need to find a hiding place. Yeah. Job is brought to the awareness that if he's ever going to be justified, he's going to have to be justified by God and God alone. Yeah. He repents of his righteousness. He, uh, being ignorant of God's righteousness, has went about too long to establish his own righteousness. Yeah. And God's testimony of Job and and Satan's accusations of Job and friends' accusation of Job, all of them were against him, but God was for him. In Adam, we all die. All of us do. Even what we consider perfect. But you know what? Uh, I believe when God created Adam, he gave him a beautiful home. Gave him a beautiful place to live. But I believe in the resurrection we got a better place than Adam lived in. Amen. Amen. I believe Job's children were raised from the dead. He has double everything he had except his children. And he got those same ten. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, abhor the flesh. The latter end is where the blessing is. Yeah. The latter end is where God blessed Job more than at the first. You might have a lot of things in Adam. But I'm telling you what, in Christ, I got a city made to go. Amen. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to quit. Let's bow for prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one looking around for just a moment.